And so at this point, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, dudes and dudettes, manati na maodi, I want to ask you to stand up on your feet. Stand up on your feet. Jump up on your feet. We want to celebrate the man of God. God has given us a lead visionary. God has given us a pastor. God has given us a father who is able to rejoice as much as our heavenly father is in our gathering. And not just him, but we have a mama as well. Praise the Lord for Pastor Carol. But for now, to lead us in the first session, ladies and gentlemen, can we just give it up? Put your hands together for Pastor Moravi Wancha. Welcome, Pasi. Welcome, welcome. Wow. To God be the glory. Glory. Amen. 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 Hey, hey um, um, I just want to say, my goodness, God is in the house. We're in the presence of the Most High God. So come on, let's just say, let's, let's just come before him right now and just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're here, Lord. We just enthrone you. We bless you. We say you're awesome, Lord. Lord, we can never say it enough. We could spend hours in your presence and we cannot get enough. We love you, Lord Jesus. Our hearts are full of expectation. Come on, just tell him. I am expecting a word from you today. I'm expecting not to be the same. I'm expecting to live here different. I'm expecting to be filled with your spirit, Lord. Those things I've been praying, I'm seeing the answers to my prayer. They're happening in this house. They're happening today, Lord. Lord, I'm coming. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Come on, somebody pray that prayer. Be Jacob today. Say, Lord, I'm going to hold on to you. Be that woman that held on to the, the garment and say, Jesus, I'm holding on. If I touch you, if I just touch the hem of your garment, Lord, something's going to happen in my life. Father God, we bless your name. We worship you. We welcome you into this space. Come and be enthroned among your children, Lord. It's such a delight to be here. We can't wait for what you have for us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We bless you. We celebrate you. For it's in Jesus' name, that mighty and matchless name, that we pray and all God's people say together, Amen, Amen and Amen. To God be the glory. Hey, please have your seats. Well, uh, just so excited to be here. Uh, for our online audience, we're excited you're here as well. I mean, I wish you could be here uh, physically. We'd love to just en engage with all our family, but we're glad you're watching wherever you're, you're watching, whatever watch party you're part of. Uh, please feel free to put comments uh, on your chat because uh, uh, we've got a team of pastors listening to those, and if you have questions or things, they'll get to us as well. So please feel free to interact uh, using that platform. Oh my goodness, we're here. We're here. Like, you know, this year, the first, when the first reached, I, the first thought I had was, this is the year the gathering starts. Like, by the way, I've been so excited about this gathering. I've, I've really been looking forward to it. How many of you participated in November 21st gathering? Let me just see, show of hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like was that something? And the, the sense that God gave me is that this is just a beginning. Like, this is going to be way bigger than anything we've ever experienced. Uh, this is our first, first time, like Pastor Kilonzi said, to just open up this gathering. And I know there are other people who are going to be joining us as days go by. Uh, but I'm so excited. By the way, I'm, like, I feel like you need to be here from the day one. Yeah. You need to be here from day one. And what I've been praying is that you will so encounter God today. Those of you who are thinking I'm just coming for Wednesday, you'll realize you are not coming for Wednesday. You're actually supposed to be here the whole week. Because I believe that God has some intensely incredible things he wants to teach us. I bless God for all of you who flew in to be here. Uh, I recognize there are some of you who've paid a cost, man. You got on a plane. You had to come. Let's just appreciate all our people who, who are from other countries, who've come from different places. In fact, let me just ask you to stand so we can see you and just bless God for you. All of you who got on a plane to, to this gathering. Come on, come on, come on. Stand up. Woo! Come on. Get, let's give a big shout to them. We bless God for you. Amen. Huh? Bicycles. You did what? Planes and buses. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory for you. And it's not just a bus from Nakuru. I mean, it's like serious, like many hours to come here. And so we bless God for every one of you, and we're so grateful you're here. My goodness, it's not like it's an investment that's worth it. I promise you. I promise you. You know one thing I love about God? You can never out-hype Him. I learned that a long time ago. You can never say God is going to do great things, and then God can't do those things. Because the Bible tells us no eye. No ear, 
no mind has imagined the things that God has, what God has in store for those who love him. And so that's the thing I say. It's like, I, I can try and tell you guys God is going to do great things, but no, I have seen. Even my eyes have not seen. And so I'm really looking forward to what God is going to do. This is the first day we're doing a four-day gathering at Mavuno Church. Uh, and we're part of history. We're part of history. The guys who are in this room right now, you're part of history. When Pastor, I don't know if you receive, Pastor Kilonzi, when you're prophesying, I was receiving. Because a time will come when we'll be doing a gathering in Southern Africa. And another gathering in Australia. And another gathering in, some, in Japan. And, and this is just going to be the guys who will say, I was there in when it started, when those four days gathering started, I was there. I was in the room when God began to do what he was doing. And this is not a work of man. All glory goes to him. And so, Pastor Kelonzi, I received that word. I don't believe that was your word. That was the Holy Spirit who revealed that to you uh, at that moment. So we're going to be just connecting with the heart of God for this movement. That's what we're here for. We're connecting with the heart of God for us and what he has for us this year. The things that he has in store, he's going to start revealing some of them uh, in this space. And as we talked about in the morning, he's going to start just, I believe that even the gifts of the Holy Spirit will be poured out in this place. That some of you will live with gifts you did not come with or we did, you did not know you had. And that were locked up and God is actually going to just reveal them to you as we get into our times of prayer and as we just listen to God's word. And so I just want to really thank God for every one of you. I bless God for uh, and honor uh, all the, the, the pastors in the house. I bless God especially for the network pastors. As I listened to the churches that they, they administer, I thought, my goodness, you guys carry a lot of weight. Huh? It's like, uh, let me just ask our exec team if you could just stand, the exec couples, if you could just stand. Let's honor our leaders, God, guys. These are the leaders God has given us. They pray for us. They, oh, Mavuno, you can do better than that. To God be the glory for every single one of them. We bless God. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask all of you to sit and leave the pastor of the house, Pastor James, standing. Because uh, you know, guys, this is his birthday. Oh, today. Today. Can I say how old you are? I just keep that under wraps. Oh, you're okay. You're, you're secure. So 37 years ago, this young man was born and he came into the world. And I'm so delighted that God has allowed him to be here, that we can celebrate his birthday with him. So can we sing for him happy birthday? Yeah. Pastor James, you could have been out on the beach with your wife. You've chosen to be here and celebrate your birthday in the Lord's house. May the Lord bless you and establish you. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor James. Happy birthday to you. Woo! Oh. <laughs> Amen. This is the lowest you'll ever be. Take it from me. This is the lowest you'll ever be. Amen. Wow. You know, I, I used to... My birthday always fell in the time when I had to be traveling, and I was always in some church or the other. And I used to resent that. I'd be like, I'm the only guy, nobody, my family never gets to sing me happy birthday. I remember the pit of it was one day I was preaching in some conference, and at the conference, they, some guys came at the back in the green, green room with a cupcake and a little candle. That was my 40th birthday, by the way. Like, like happy birthday. And I was like, God. I've given everything to follow you. It's, it's like, but you know what? You can never outgive God. The best thing you can ever do with your life is to give it to God. And I mean, I'm telling you, Pastor James, this is the lowest you'll ever be. Watch those words. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to God for you. Now, if, I believe if you've been part of Mavuno for the last two months or the last few months, you've sensed that something has changed. If you've been part of this, you know, the apostles, the, the, the disciples asked Jesus, where have you been? Have you been part of this Jerusalem? Uh, have you been part of this Mavuno? There's things that God has been doing. Have you, has anybody sensed there's a change in the last six months, in the last year that God has been bringing about? Uh, there's something that God is doing. And I don't know if you've sensed it, but God is in the middle of doing something. He's, he's making all things new, is the word he gave to us. He's just making all things new. And I, I remember today as, as I've been praying, that's all I've been praying about is just, Lord, thank you for making all things new. I know churches that have had a great history and then they got stuck in that history. They had a great past and a great reputation. And they got stuck talking about the days when God moved. And I bless God that that's not us. That the things ahead of us are far greater than anything we ever saw behind us. That we're, we're about to enter into days that will make the things we rejoiced in the past look like small things. Uh, that's the God we serve. 
And so I'm so delighted. By the way, guys, I don't feel intimidated if you say amen. Uh, you, you don't throw me off when, I, when you say amen. Just do, if you're feeling that you might throw me off my rhythm, don't worry. I can take it. I'm secure. So you can shout amen when the Lord inspires you to shout amen. It even helps me preach better when you say amen. So, so, so yeah, so thank you. And you know, I teach for obedience. So if you don't say amen, I might just keep teaching. <laughs> amen. So, so today, I'm, I'm going to just start setting the stage because I want to share a bit about, I want us to get deeper into some of the reasons God is leading us to do some of the things we are doing in this season. Because I believe that they are critical things. It's important to do things with understanding. So last year, we learned about uh, just some rhythms that help us as a church. And we started to learn about how to engage with those rhythms. Uh, uh, Apostle Mo is the one who began that journey, just calling, he called it Perth. And we've already begun to see those things happening. So I want to just begin with daily prayer. Uh, I'm going to just talk about prayer and why prayer is important. So that's really what I want to talk about uh, this morning. Uh, you know, it's interesting because one of the questions I always ask myself when I was younger is, why pray when God already knows it's what's going to happen? Have you ever found yourself asking that question? Like, why do I need to pray and God already knows? It's like, Jesus, please help. But Jesus already knows what's going to happen. The Bible says he knows the beginning from the end. He's, he's omnis omniscient. He knows everything. So why am I begging someone to do what he already knows is going to happen? Prayer is counterintuitive. Prayer is not as obvious as it looks when you really ask those questions. Why am I pleading with someone to do whatever he knows he's going to do anyway? Yeah. Why am I doing that? God, God is not, he, he can't be manipulated to change his mind. He's already decided what's going to happen. So why am I pleading with him and he already knows what's going to happen? You know, the Bible tells us, Psalm 115, that our God is in heaven. He does what pleases him. So why am I begging him and he's already, he's still, we know what he's going to do. What is he going to do? What pleases him? So what business do I have? praying then? I think those are some of the questions I had when I was a little uh, younger as a, as a Christian. And many times, Christians don't play, pray regularly because they don't understand. So I'm going to talk about, let me just start by saying some reasons why we don't pray regularly. Uh, some reasons why we struggle to pray. And first reason is ignorance. Ignorance. Like I said, the question I was asking was an ignorant question because I didn't understand. What, why am I praying when God already knows what he wants to do? I mean, God wants me to beg him, yet he already has decided. He knows whether this person is going to live or die, so why do I have to pray and he's already decided? The Bible says in Psalm 1, 147, verse 5, Great is our Lord. <laughs> Great is our Lord. Abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. <laughs> so why am I with my finite understanding trying to change somebody who's already decided in his infinite understanding what he's going to do anyway? And I used to find myself struggling because I didn't know. I mean, I'd already prayed about this thing. Why does God... So, so, so the second thing, I mean, for me, that, that was the first one that was just so perplexing. Then I used to ask, why pray if God already knows what I'm going to say? Mm. Our Father who art in heaven. Okay, I knew you'd say that. It's like, it's like his mind is already so far ahead of mine. So why am I bothering to pray and he even knows already what I'm going to say? Can I just sit there and... Yeah, he knows. Uh, <laughs> Psalm 139, you know, there's a verse where he says before... What, did I give that one to you? Before a word is on my tongue? Before a word is on my, yeah, before a word is on my tongue, you know, Lord, know it completely. G! It's like, <laughs> he was there. It's like, like, if it was me, I'd be like, okay, 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 come on, just talk faster. Do you ever have that? Do you ever have people who talk slowly? And it's like, you know, so what I was, go you're like, please, just talk. So if God is so far ahead of me, isn't he even bored of me talking and he knows what I'm going to say? I mean, those are the questions I'd ask myself. And here's another one. I used to ask, I've already prayed about this thing. Why does God want me to say it again? Wow. Have you ever found yourself asking that? It's like, if, if you've already told your husband, sweetie, uh, I'd really like you to get me a perfume. And then the next day it's like, sweetie, I'd really like you to get me a perfume. And then day three, so it's like you're nagging at that point. It's like even the person would be like, seriously, I mean, you'd even get to the place of seriously, if you don't want to get me a perfume, I'm not going to beg you. Have you ever found yourself telling God that? <laughs> like, seriously, if, I, if you're not going to give me this thing, why do you want me to keep begging you and you know what I want? Or can we be really in the house today? Yeah. Yeah, I know we're all spiritual and all that, but maybe some of you have struggled like me. You know, it's interesting. In fact, Jesus even warned us about babbling. <laughs> 
Like he said, don't repeat yourself, repeat yourself, repeat yourself. What was that verse? Uh, it was uh, Mark, Ma, Ma, Matthew, I think. Matthew 6. I think I sent those verses. Do you have them? Matthew 6, 7. Okay. Thank you. Matthew 6, 7. And when you pray, do not keep on bubbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. I'm perplexed about that. It's like, Jesus, I told you yesterday what I want. Today's supplication. Pray for me, but I've prayed for miracle. How many miracles? How many times do I pray for miracle? It's like I should pray once, God heard, and because he never forgets anyway. <laughs> He's not like my husband who might have forgotten conveniently about the perfume. God never forgets. So why do I have to keep asking him? And so some of these questions are the questions that really st stumbled me and made it hard for me to keep praying. And many questions, many Christians have questions like these. And unfortunately, our lack of understanding about how prayer works and the purpose of prayer will often keep us from praying. That's one of the things that kept us from praying. Another reason, let me give another reason. I'll come back to, to, to the answer to some of those questions. But another reason why we struggle to pray is fear of disappointment. Fear of disappointment. My goodness. I don't, I don't know if you've ever prayed for something and you're disappointed that it didn't happen. Yeah. You prayed and it's like, Lord, I want to be an A star in those exams. <laughs> what did you get? Eh? <laughs> You got something completely different. Oh, <laughs> when you saw your exams. It's like, huh? <laughs> like, like, Lord, you disappointed me. I prayed. I fasted. Sometimes it's something even more serious. I prayed for that person to be healed. They died. Yeah. I prayed for us to keep our house. It was sold. It was auctioned. I prayed for good weather on Sundays as a pastor. By the way, by the way, <laughs> church planters. Any church planters in the house, they know that one. <laughs> by the way, you have to plant a church to feel that one. Like I used to, when we planted Mavuno Church in South Sea, I used to go, like I'd start feeling drops, and then the road was bad. So I knew already immediately half the congregation isn't coming. So I'd go and stand in the field and just say, Elijah was a man just like us. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> and sometimes you just say, <laughs> the lightning comes and you're like, God, no! <laughs> oh my goodness! What's happening? I've prayed, I was disappointed. And many times because of disappointment, it's like, I don't even know. I want to just manage my expectations. Because, you know, if you know you're going to be disappointed by someone, if you have an alcoholic person in your life, at some point you manage your expectation, isn't it? It's like, I won't ask because I know you'll disappoint me. And sometimes we reach there as Christians. It's like, you know, I, I, just, I just don't want to ask because I've been disappointed. And some of us even get bitter. We're in the house of God, but we're bitter at God. And that's where we are. Uh, it's just, am I talking to somebody in the house today? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, this, this happens and it's common. Number three, feeling unqualified. Another reason why we, don't, we struggle to pray is we feel unqualified. Uh, I don't know if about you, but I don't know if you've ever found yourself feeling like you're praying all wrong. Like you listen to pastor so-and-so string those prayers together, put in the right verses at the right point, share, just, just invoke the name of heaven, say things and you're like, oh God, now me. <laughs> One verse. Appli uh, supplication, thanksgiving, adoration. And he's just finding ways to weave scripture. And you're like, God must be hearing that guy. But as for me, I can't even remember verses when I'm praying. Uh, <laughs> Am I talking to somebody in the house? And, and, and sometimes you just feel, I just don't have it. And that's why I believe that many of us, we delegate prayer to pastors. And it's like, let me just go to pastor so-and-so because God seems to hear this guy when he prays. And that's, that's I, I think many times that's a lack of understanding. You know, we, we don't understand because we feel like our prayers are, 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 are not as qualified as somebody else's prayers. Um, that, that's, that's a very dangerous place to pray. I, I think when Jesus talked about the Pharisee who was um, in the temple and he was praying and was a tax collector and the Pharisee is praying all eloquent, biblical, quoting the Torah. And this guy is just saying, Lord, have mercy on me as a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me and mercy. Now, that's all he knows to pray. And the Bible says, whose prayer wa was heard by God? It's this guy. So it's ignorance that makes us think sometimes that my prayer cannot be heard by God. So, so, so here's the thing. And some of us, we struggle. We struggle because we feel unqualified. There are distractions around us. I don't know. You start praying and you just, your mind starts going. 
And you start, you find something in your house that you're already thinking about. You see something, that, a chair that was not put right. Am I talking to somebody? And you, you've already moved to, to move the chair right. And you, you've even lost your train of thought. And it's like, pray for an hour, God. That's so hard for me to do. And you know, it's so interesting because many of us struggle with this. And that's why sometimes in the, in the 430 prayer, I, I challenge the pastors. I always say, guys, I want more prayer and less talking. Because we have to learn how to pray. The only way to learn how to pray is just to pray. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because um, in Matthew 8.2, there's a really interesting uh, scripture. Matthew 8.2, it says, A man with leprosy came and knelt before him, Jesus, and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I've always been struck by that verse. Because this guy, he didn't say, Lord, if you can, you can make me clean. He was not struggling with Jesus' ability. He had probably seen Jesus heal other people. He had had enough testimony to be convinced. In fact, the fact that he calls him Lord tells you already he knows this guy can do it. What was his problem? If you are willing. It just tells you where his, which space he was coming from. He's like, this guy is so important, I don't think my issues matter to him. And many of us, that's where we're coming from. It's like, Lord, are you willing, really? Like I've asked before, are you willing? Like maybe when Pastor Kilonzi prays, you'll be willing because he's your... <laughs> He's like a few steps ahead of me. But I don't feel like he's willing to change for me. There are people with direct lines to heaven. Let me trust them to pray. Another reason, there are several other reasons as, as, as I was just thinking about this. Now, one is busyness. We're busy people. Um, we have crazy schedules. We have work. We have demands. We've got young children. Uh, it's just that season. There's school for some of us. Some of us, you're, you're running all that, plus you're also managing your home as a wife, and you know your stress. You, you, somehow there's a way that women carry the house more than men. As much as we are liberated and we try and share the chores, there's just a way that the, the, you walk into the house, and if you're the guy, they're just things that you don't carry psychologically. I've come to, I, I came to con that conclusion eventually after being married for years. I just realized there are some things my wife carries that I can never carry in that house. It's just, and then you're stressed. And with all that happening, how do I pray? I don't have time. There's too much going on. And I don't know if you've ever found yourself in that space where you're too busy to pray. It's like you're leaving the house and you're running to the next thing. Uh, somebody said it's like the guy who was too busy to fuel his car. You're driving and you're so late and you're so busy you can't fuel. And that's, you already know how this story is going to end, isn't it? Because you don't even get where you're going because you ran out of fuel before you got there. But many times we don't understand that's what happens when I'm too busy to pray. I run out of spiritual fuel that even the things I was too busy to pray, I start, my, I start burning out on those things because I'm neglecting the fuel that I need. So busyness is another one. I'm too bitter to pray is another one. Anybody who's ever been bitter... You're bitter at somebody, you're just angry, you're just not in a space. In fact, another one that's connect, connected with that is when people feel, I'm too spiritually dry. Anybody been spiritually dry? Yeah. yeah, it's like, I just don't have the energy to master up. Like, I feel like I'm faking it. I feel like, you know what, I just, I'm not feeling it. Anybody ever been in a place where you're not feeling it? Yeah, yeah I've been there. I mean, the one thing that comforts me whenever I'm in that space is that God doesn't answer my prayers according to how I feel. I've always loved that, by the way. Because many times I used to think it's like I have to feel it. But my prayers have nothing to do with feelings. But many, t many of us get, get in that space where you're just like, I just, I'm feeling dry. I'm just feeling burnt out. I just feel like I can't even pray. Another one that, I, that is uh, important is I'm too ashamed. I'm too ashamed. There are things I've done. There are things I said last night. There are things I say to my kids. There's things I've, I've done that, um, that make me feel like God will not accept my prayers. Uh, and that's another one that just, I'm, I've messed up too much. Now, I, I know you know this, but even knowing it, sometimes you still feel that way. But you know what? I love that prayer of the Pharisee, of the tax collector that just says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I love the fact that he still came to the temple. I love the fact that he still came to be heard by God, even though everybody hated him. The Pharisees looked at him like, what is this one doing here? But he came. He came anyway. And many times we have to just come to God's presence like that tax collector. And then the other one for me that I can identify with, and I discovered it by accident, is things are going really well for me. Like this one is interesting, because some of you, you've not gotten there yet. When, when, when you're young and you're broke <laughs> and, and you have issues, prayer is easier. 
Yeah, prayer is easier. But then if you can't pray when you're young and broke, trust me, you're in trouble. <laughs> because things will not get easier for you. When you get to a place where things are going really well, that can be a hard place to be. I, I, I'll tell you how I discovered it. Um, there's a time when I, got a, I took a sabbatical. I'd been working for many years, and the church finally allowed me to take six months and just go and rest. And I remember the first month, I, I made a strange discovery. I couldn't pray. And I'd wake up, and I'd be like, I just don't feel like praying. I'm really struggling to pray. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. It's like I had no zeal to be in God's presence at all. Then it struck me what was happening. For many, many years, I had been in the front line of war. I'd wake up and I'd be praying about demons. By the way, let me tell you in your church planting, you pray for demons, huh? When you guys wake up at 4.30 to pray in your prayer meeting, me, I've already been up praying for you guys. That's how pastors are. We're up earlier. I'm already praying for that prayer meeting. When you come to church on Sunday and you've checked into God's house, me, I've been in prayer long before that. So I'd been at war. Every day there were demons to slay. Every day there were altars to raise. Every day there were people who were coming and I needed to have God's authority to speak his word. If you're a young pastor, you know what I'm talking about. There are times you feel so intimidated by your church, you're like, you're just there shaking and you're saying, God, give me authority. I prayed because I had a need. And then for the next few months, I did not have any need. It's not that there were no demons, but somebody else was praying about them. <laughs> and the church was looked after. And I realized my prayer with God was so transactional that I didn't know how to pray when I didn't need anything. Oh my God, it's a, it, was a I, it was such a crazy place to be. And some of us, we get there. I mean, I've seen people leave church because God blessed them. Yeah, they prayed that God would bless their business and they got all that they needed. And it's like, I don't need to pray. And I no longer feel an urgency to be in church. Last scene. Sundays they're jogging in Karura with their dog. And their little spits. <laughs> Japanese spits. And their little children are riding their bikes beside them. And then after that they go and stop and have pizza. It's like our family day. Brunch. They go and have brunch for their family day. They just don't have a need. <laughs> so, so these are some of the reasons why people don't pray. This, I've found that there are reasons why people just don't pray. But... My sermon is really simple today. I'm just talking about reasons people don't pray. Then I want to talk about why should you pray daily? Why should you pray daily? Because you know, the scripture tells us that the, the heroes of our faith, they prayed, and they didn't just pray when there was trouble. They prayed daily. Um, I don't know how many times Jesus prayed, but Mark chapter 1, 35, it tells us that he prayed in the morning. It says very early in the morning when it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place, where he prayed. So you get the sense that that was his habit, that this is something he did. His disciple, and it happens enough times in scripture that you're like, yeah, this seems to be Jesus' habit. And he got up when it was still dark. By the way, that was my conviction about why we pray at 4.30. It's like Jesus prayed when it was still dark. And I, I, um, for me, I thought there are two reasons why 4.30. I mean, somebody asked, why 4.30? There's no magical reason. Uh, we could have prayed at 6, and there are churches that pray that by, at 6, and God still answers their prayers. But for me, I thought, number one, this traffic, especially if you live in cities that have a lot of traffic, and you're waking up kids to get them to school. Wake up early, finish. By the time your kids are up and you're changing to go to work, it gives you enough time. But my second reason is because I live in a place where there are Muslims, and Muslims wake up at by five, to pray at five. I was like, surely I can't be waking up at the same time with, the, with somebody who's not part of the kingdom to claim the neighborhood. I want, by the time the Muslims are praying, in fact, they're wondering why their PAs are not working. They're wondering why there's a, there's, the, the sky is just led for them. They're not understanding that someone has already taken charge and altars have already been set up and it's too late. So for me, 4.30, by I always pray at 4.30. By the time, time they even talk, I can't even hear them. I'm so far gone and I'm praying. So, so Jesus prayed every day while it was still dark. Uh, Daniel, now we know how many times he prayed because in Daniel chapter 6, uh, it tells us in verse 10, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So I love this. Daniel was in trouble. He was being framed at work. People were out to get his neck, to get his job. He went into prayer mode. 
But the crazy thing about Daniel, it was just as he had done before. He didn't change his frequency of prayer because guys, his boss was about to fire him. He was already praying three times a day. I love that. Oh, guys, come on. This is the, this is the shortest you'll ever pray. For 35, that is just beginning. It's just training wheels. This man of God would go three times a day. And he's, by the way, he's a prime minister. So for those of you who think you're busy, <laughs> yeah, he's a busy man. He's an important man. Three times a day. I love that. Now, another busy guy who tells us how many times he prays. And I think for me, I'm, I'm inspired by these guys. Whenever I feel like I'm so busy leading my church, you know, I'm an important man. I have a significant church. I look at Daniel, who's a prime minister. I'm like, hey, okay, maybe I'm not that important. But here's another guy. He wasn't even a prime minister. He was a king. Psalm 119. Uh, he says, this is David. <laughs> he says, seven times a day I will praise you for your righteous laws. Oh, come on, somebody. King David, the man who is on the throne, the man who has conquered all the enemies of Israel. How many times a day? Seven times a day. That's how much this guy would just be like, okay, guys, I know there's a judgment. Uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> and he's off. And guys are like, where is this guy going? Guys, Jesus, I exalt you. Okay, there's no Jesus at that point. They're like, God, I exalt you. It's like seven times. That no wonder the Bible calls him the man after God's own heart. That's why. By the way, have you ever wondered why he was called that? This is why. Because he sought his God seven times a day. So, so why should we seek God? Why should we pray every day? So here are some reasons. And for, you, for those of you who've ever wondered, you know, why am I praying and God already knows? Why am I praying and God already knows what I'm going to say? Uh, what, why am I begging for things? These are the reasons why you pray every day. Number one, to connect with headquarters. To connect with HQ. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Wakanda. This, this should be a technical question. <laughs> yeah. but Black Panther, yeah. I, I even call it Wakanda in my mind. Black Panther, yeah. The second one, I think, is going to be called Wakanda something. Huh? Wakanda forever, yeah. Yeah, it's coming out. Yeah, yeah. The plot, oh, I go on. <laughs> oh, you can, yeah, we can go watch. We'll, we'll, we'll do a watch party. <laughs> you know, it's got a very interesting scene because the, the plot revolves around this hidden nation of Wakanda that, is, um, that nobody really can see it. But then uh, in this nation, um, they, they're keeping an eye on the most powerful nation in the world, uh, the U.S. And so they have, a, they have a spy. They have an ambassador. They have a guy who is there who nobody knows what he's really there for. And he's there uh, with an agenda from the home country. But if you watch the movie, you, you realize something happens. And it's something that you don't quite tell what's happening until towards the end of the movie. But what happens is this guy forgets why he was sent. And he stops representing his home government and starts being more concerned about the, the government that he's in. He becomes a person of that government. Start, he starts being concerned with the concerns of the people of this world. He forgets the concerns of the people who sent him. And so if you remember, there's a very tragic moment where his brother, who is the king, actually kills him, assassinates him, because this guy has now become treasonous. He's, he's actually guilty of treason, and he's actually undermining his nation. And, and that thing really struck me when I watched that. I don't know why it was so clear to me, because my thought was, as Christians, we are ambassadors of a hidden kingdom. And as we walk around looking very ordinary, nobody knows what we're really here for. But we're here to represent the kingdom that we come from. And many times, guess what happens? When we lose touch with our home country, we forget our mission. You forget what God put you in that employment for. You forget why God helped you start that business. You forget why God gave you those children. And at some point, you start representing the things of this world and being more passionate about them than about the things of the kingdom where you came from. And the king is not happy. The king is not happy when we do that. And so, we're told by the Bible many times, we are ambassadors. You're an ambassador. This is who you are. You should not forget your mission. Paul talks about this to the Corinthians in, sec in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And he says, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, uh, if you put up that verse, 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, Therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. We, we implore you on, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul is like, by the way, as we're telling guys to be reconciled to God, we're representing an agenda. We're representing our government. 
I'm not here to, to, to just be. <laughs> I'm not here to just get em embraced by the things of this world. There's a government that I listen to that gives me the agenda for where I am. That's what prayer is doing. It's giving me the agenda. I'm listening to my government. And as an ambassador, the only way you can represent your gov government is if you know what they stand for. So one of the parts of the ambassador's job is, yes, going out there, uh, cutting deals for their country, talking to big dignitaries on behalf of their country, but the other part, which is just as important, is listening to what's going on from home. That ambassador has to be getting a brief every day. This is, what, this is what the president's position on this. This is what's happening. This is what the interests of your home country are. That's what prayer is. You're catching God's voice for your office that day. When I'm going around and I'm talking to people, I want to hear what God told me as I read his word, as I listened to his voice, as I prayed and as I spent time with him, I go in with an agenda. I meet people and I already know God's agenda for today is he healed two blind people. Lord, they are blind people I'm going to meet in my office today. And today, Lord, you want me to bring healing. And so I'm going to be bold to, to represent the government that I come from. So, so this, is, this is, when you understand this, all of a sudden prayer stops being begging and starts being listening. Because I'm understanding, I'm representing. Uh, this is the only way. Your JD depends on understanding why you're here. So, so this is how we, we stop being... So many Christians are caught up by the things of this world. So, they have embraced the world. They've become worldly. We're so concerned about worldly things. We've forgotten about the things that represent where we come from. So, so in heaven, your home country, I keep saying the streets are made of gold. The things that the people in this country run after, they hustle, they create hustles and multiple hustles. They neglect their families for, they get corrupt for. Those things are the things we'll be walking on, where I come from. When I know that, I'm like, I belong to Wakanda, man. I'm not that guy who runs after wealth. In my kingdom, we seek the kingdom. All other things are added to us. This is how I know, because my mind now, it's, it's configured with a different reality. So that's one of the things we need to understand, that when I pray, I'm understanding how to represent the kingdom of God. I connect with headquarters. Number two, the other reason why we pray every day, and we're going to keep praying, is to relate with our Father. To relate with our Father. You know, it's interesting because prayer is relationship. These, 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 these disciples of Jesus, they were Jewish. And Jewish men, by the time they were reaching 12, they had read through the Torah. They knew it back and forth. They had their bar mitzvah. They were being now confirmed as, as being real Jewish men. Even non-theologians had to go through that. So these guys knew the law of Moses. They knew, all, they, they knew things of scripture. But when they watched Jesus praying, they were like, I mean, they'd been taught to pray all their lives. But they're like, teach us how to pray. <laughs> it's like you now, the way you're such a serious believer. And then you listen to somebody praying, and you're like, just teach me how to pray. It's a very humble thing to say because they saw something in Jesus that they didn't have. And what was it? It comes out in Jesus' first words. He says, our Father in heaven. You see, Jews did not consider God to be, he was a father, but that was not a title they used for him. That's not their primary frame of reference. You'd have said the almighty God, or heavenly king, the master of the universe. They would have used some powerful words to describe him. Jesus called him daddy. Mm. And they're like, what intimacy is this? Teach us how to pray. Because you see, for Jesus, prayer was not just an activity. It was connecting with his father. It was a love relationship. He had conversations with God. So, so imagine you have two sons. And uh, one, son number one, uh, he sees you coming home. He runs to the door. He opens it. He hugs you. He's like, let me grab your bags. Daddy, you're home. I'm so excited. How was your day? Can I get you some tea? And you're like, Wow. And then son number two is that guy who he's not really moved when you come home, but he always comes when he needs something. And he always like, hey, daddy, what's up? And you're like, what does he want? <laughs> Which of those sons would you delight in more? <laughs> of course, of course. There's a son who would be like, you can't even wait to see him. And then that other son where you're like even suspicious, like this guy, is, the only reason he's coming close is because there's something he wants. Let me ask you the question, what son are you? Yeah? What son are you? 
Are you that person that when God sees you coming into the heavenlies, walking boldly into the throne of grace, where you may receive mercy and grace in your time of need, he's like, what does he want? <laughs> or is he like, my God, he's like, wow, he's here again. I love this son. It's so much fun to be with him. Remember, Jesus had 12 disciples, but there was one disciple called the disciple that Jesus loved. And God doesn't show favoritism. But there was a disciple who was a disciple Jesus loved. And I put it to you, why? It's because this disciple loved Jesus. He spent more time with Jesus. He put his lap on, his head on Jesus' lap during the meal. It's like, this is my guy. He stuck to him like that son. And everybody else was around him was like, this is a disciple Jesus loves. That's the title they used for him. Who are you? What kind of son are you? If you desire a deeper, meaningful relationship with God, then you need to talk to him more than just handing him a, prayer, a laundry list every morning. The time my prayers used to just be lists. I have a list of things I need. Every day, I'm praying for myself. Every day, I'm praying. My God, I started learn, learning that prayer is so... The, the language of prayer is so much deeper than supplication. That's like just one little part of prayer that I was teaching myself. Ask, ask, ask. And the Bible says ask. There's nothing wrong with asking. But you know what happens when you start to learn how to adore God? Your prayer life moves to another level. By the way, I find sometimes... I run out of time in adoration <laughs> if I'm left by myself. That's why, by the way, sometimes I like the guided prayers because I can spend a whole hour just telling God how amazing he is. It's, and it's like the language improves the more you increase, you, the more you do it. I remember I had a visitor. We had a visitor. Carol and I had a visitor come to our house and stay with us for a little while. And when he was leaving, he said, when I've been surprised, he was from another nation, he said, I've been surprised because you guys, every time you pray, we had never noticed this. But he said, even when you're praying for food, you're always just adoring God and thanking God. Like the prayer, the, the ask is usually a very small thing at the end. He said, that's not how we pray where I come from. I'd never even noticed that. But what happens is you start to enjoy God's sweetness. You start to understand how amazing he is. And it's like, it's a relationship with my father. When somebody says, okay, lift up your voice and pray, you're like, oh Jesus, thank you for another opportunity to bless you. I know I spent two hours in the morning, but how nice I got to spend some more time with you. It's like, yes, I love being in your presence. And this is why we pray, because we want to connect with the one we love. Imagine if uh, you have a, a spouse, your wife, and you're like, hey, sweetie, how are you? And she's like, but we spent an hour in the morning. <laughs> why are you calling me now? <laughs> you can wait for tomorrow. I'll give you your hour again. You'd be like, what? But that's how many of us are, isn't it? It's like I prayed 4.30 to 5.30, God, cheers. <laughs> we'll see you later. But that's not, prayer is relationship. It's wanting to be with my love to him. It's understanding I'm his. And what happens is the more you pray, the more you love. It's just the way God has shaped us. So, so this, before, I used to, before I started praying for an hour, I used to have my quiet time, and I'd spend a lot of time reading the Bible. I think I'm, I'm, I'm a Bible, I, like, I love reading the Bible. I think I was discipled by theologians. So I'd love to look for those connections and whatever. And then I'd, 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 I'd spend an hour, and then maybe the last 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I'd, I'd do prayers based on what I read. And I'd feel pretty good. I had a quiet time. I spent time in prayer. My goodness, I've come to understand why. What? I mean, it's like, yeah, it's great to read God's word, but not at the expense of spending time with him in prayer. Uh, praying just begins to help me practice God's presence. In fact, the funny thing I noticed, when we started praying for this one hour prayer, and then for me, I, pray, I started praying longer, I found that it's easier for me to remember God throughout the day. Those days I used to pray and then I'd struggle. In fact, I'd get to the evening and I'd be like, oh my goodness, there's so many opportunities I could have prayed and I didn't pray. Like I'd forget. Nowadays I just find it's easy. It's natural. I'm talking to somebody and they're giving me a problem and I'm immediately praying in the spirit. It's like, Lord, give me a word to give this person. It's like I'm aware of his presence. And that's what happens when you spend time praying. It's relationship. You start to enjoy the relationship. So I want to challenge you. Start enjoying your papa. Don't, don't, don't be that guy who checks into 430 prayer at five. <laughs> there are no five o'clock prayers in Mavuno Church, by the way, in case you didn't notice, or even 445. There are no such prayers. They're at 430. In fact, for me, I love checking into, whenever I check into the network prayers, I check in a bit early, and I'm always amazed. There's some people who are always there like 420. It's like they can't wait. Their things are on. It's like they're just, they're even listening to the worship music first to set the tone in their heart before they jump in. This is the way we must be. I know we're praying at six, by the way, but I want to just challenge you, come earlier if you want to. This place is open. And don't just come earlier to high-five each other. Come up and high-five your father. <laughs> come and spend time in his presence. Just hang out with him. Let's enjoy our father. Number three reason why we must pray daily. 
is to make better decisions. To make better decisions. You know, every day we are faced with decisions. There are decisions every day. Big decisions, small decisions. De big decisions like who to marry, what school to take your children, how to do, which career to change into. Those are huge, life-changing decisions. But small decisions like where to have lunch, who to, who to sit with over lunch. Little decisions that don't seem to make that huge a difference. But the interesting thing is, uh, Miles Monroe said, your life is a sum total of the decisions that you make every day. Like every decision, big and small, it's just adding up to what your life is. And so many times we make even small decisions and we don't realize that small decision will actually change everything. That person you sat with for lunch will change everything. I remember one day at, um, at, at a Fearless Summit, um, I was preaching and in the middle of my sermon, I was talking about corruption because Fearless is about changing the society uh, and, and God's people shining the light in all sectors of society. And I remember just, I was talking about it. Then I just felt prompted to share my example. And I had no time. I mean, like my time was running short and I knew the program was running late. But I just had this urgent feeling. I need to share my example. And so I shared about the fact that I'd been in this project, uh, a real estate development, and I'd, it had, I'd been doing it for five years and I'd hit major headwinds. And we had been stuck for five years simply because of corruption. And I just felt like I need to share that I'm a victim of it as well. As much as I perpetrate it sometimes, I'm also a victim. And I, and I was talking about the fact that we are all, all of us are affected in some way. And I remember I just shared it. And I was like, I don't even know why I felt such an urgency to share it. Uh, I had to cut something else in the message because of giving that story. But anyway, after the, the end of the day, as I was walking out, this young lady comes up to me. And she tells me, you know what, um, Pastor, I just felt a prompting in my spirit when you gave that example. Like, I don't even remember anything else you said. But I just felt in my spirit God told me, go and help that man. And she said, I, um, I'm, I've, I've done some work in lands. I'm very young at it. But I just feel like God would want me to dedicate myself. She had no job. And she felt like God was telling her, this is going to be your job now. Go and help that pastor and don't ask him for money. And can you believe it for the next year? This lady just slogged at it. She'd go and sit in the land registry, push those documents. Uh, sometimes I just give her money because I'm like, you need to survive. She's a mother of children. And she just gave herself towards this work. And right now, that project is unstuck. I'm hoping this year we'll actually begin it. But this lady, God prompted me to say something I wasn't going to say so that it could unlock something that had been locked for five years. So, so, so the smallest decision, like who you, make, you meet, you, who, you, who you have lunch with, could change your destiny. Could change your destiny. And prayer is what's helping you be in touch with the one who helps you make those decisions. So as you're praying in the day, it's understanding, my goodness, I'm praying over my day. I'm praying for divine helpers. I'm praying for destiny helpers. And you know what? I'm just aligning myself to hear God's voice when the time to make the decision comes. So this, this is such an important time. I mean, I remember the story in the book of Esther. There's another decision like that, Mordecai. And Mordecai was sitting at the gate, the king's gate. And, 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 and yeah, during the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bikthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. And then it turns, Mordecai found out and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. What made Mordecai sit down at the gate that day? Because the Bible doesn't tell us that was his habit. He, maybe he took his park lunch. You know, I guess as a Jew, maybe he couldn't eat what was in the kitchen. So maybe he brought his park lunch that had its own kosher food in it. And he decided, man, I need to find a place to sit. And he said, there's a nice place to sit at the gate. And he sat. And at the same time, two other guys were sitting and they're conspiring. And just because he sat on that spot, he heard about the plot. He had no clue that what he had had would save not only the life of his niece, but would save an entire nation from genocide. That, that one place he sat, the decision to sit there for lunch changed the nation. Can you see how powerful your small decisions are? So, so as you're praying, when I come to prayer, I pray through my day. I pray through my appointments. I pray through the people I'm encountering that day. I protect the day in prayer before I get into the day. I pray the day, I live the day in prayer before I live the day actually. And guess what happens when I get there? The day is ready for me. And that's what happens to Mordecai. This is another reason why we must pray. And it's connected with my number four. Because my number four is to command my day. To command my day. You know, we have authority. But often we don't understand it. 
something sets the tone for our day, and often it's not ourselves. Many times it's the WhatsApp message I read when I woke up. That, you, you, know, you know those days when you wake up and the first thing you do is you pick your phone and you checked WhatsApp, and then you find that your contract was cancelled. Or they're now doing a review at work and you might lose your job. And guess what has happened? That message has just set the tone of your day. Because even your mind in prayer is fragmented, you're panicking, you pray short so that you can go and do your research and find out what's happening, and it's like your day has been commanded by another source. That is why, guys, as a rule, I never check WhatsApp or anything else before I do my, my prayer time. It's always, I start my day. I start my day by reading God's word and prayer. That's what I always do. Because the thing I read first determines my day. The, thing, the words that I declare first determine my day. My first thoughts determine my day. And you know, when I've spent time before God, and, I've, and I've, been, I've, I've been in that space in God's word, and every situation I've brought before God in adoration, I've made him king over the day. I've said, Lord, whatever happens, you're the one in charge. And then I've confessed my fears and my sins and my inabilities. And I've said, God, you're my strength. Fill me with your spirit. And then I've come with thanksgiving. I've counted all God's blessings. And I've remembered if God could do it in the past, he's going to do it in the future. And then I've brought my day in supplication moment by moment and meeting by meeting before God. And then I open that WhatsApp. And I say, oh my God, my God who blessed me yesterday can bless me today. Ha! Ah, and I command that day and I say, this boss did not hire me. God himself put me in this factory. If it is time for me to leave, God will show me today. That's a different way to command my day. Something else did not command my day. I commanded it because of where I sat. Are you understanding? So this is why I'm praying. I'm not praying to beg God. I'm praying to determine how my day goes. Because the, the joy of the Lord is my strength when I spend time with God. And joy does not have to do with circumstances. Even when the circumstances go this way, I'm not swayed. This is, this is one of the reasons we spend that time. And that's when you begin to understand this, you want to spend more time. In fact, when I read about the saints, the generals of God's kingdom, if you ask them what their biggest regret was, most of them will say, I wish I spent more time praying. Nobody says, I wish I spent more time making money. <laughs> yeah, it's I wish I spent more time in the Father's presence because I missed opportunities because I didn't understand. You know, um, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Can you put that on the board? Proverbs 18, 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. By the way, when I, pray, when I command my day, I don't beg my day. <laughs> and I don't beg God to give me my day. God has already said, rule and subdue. And he's already told me, all power and authority are in me, so go and make those disciples. Go and, sub, go and make disciples of nations. So when I command my day, I speak into it. I say, my son will not frustrate me today. <laughs> Parents in the house, this one is going to be great. He will encounter God today in whatever he does. My daughter will succeed in whatever she does. I call it out. Lord, they will be ten times wiser than their classmates. They will be distinguished and they will be noticed because they are yours. I call it out. I'm commanding my day. I'm determining how my day turns out. And this is a power, you know. Uh, James 5.16, when he talks about confess your sins to one another, it says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I love that. So, so that's what I'm, it's like my prayers will avail. I don't beg, I speak. Because there's power, life and death in the power of my tongue. Number five, to subdue the earth. To subdue the earth. There's a great verse in First Peter that talks about that. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. It helps me begin to understand. Because it tells me, be well balanced, <laughs> which tells me temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all all times. Why? For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. What is that telling you? It's telling you you have an enemy. And every day, every day, he's prowling. He's looking for weakness. He's looking for the one he can devour. He's looking for the Christian to bring down. And why Christian? Because you, the minute you become a Christian, you're in, the opposite. You're, in the, you're in the opposition. You're not his son anymore. You're not connected with him anymore. He doesn't have a claim on you. And he hates you. And so the Bible tells us he's, devout, he's, he's looking, he's hunting. And Peter tells us, be sober, be well balanced, be disciplined, be, be alert, be cautious at all times. Why? Because this guy never takes a day off. 
24-7, he's prowling, he's looking, he's thinking. You know, if you've ever watched National Geographic, it's like those lions. They're, they're prowling, and there's a, there's a lioness at the front, and they're prowling. Have you ever seen those things? My wife refuses to watch them. She says, this is, this is fallen creation. Uh, she can't watch an animal killing another animal. She says, this will never happen in heaven, in Jesus' name. And so I have to watch National Ge Geographic by myself. Uh, so so I, lo I love to watch it, you know, and it's like it's prowling. And then guess what they do? They identify the one that's isolated and the one that looks weak, and then they go for it. And it's, that's what the devil is doing. He's prowling. He's looking to see who he can devour. But you know what the thing about it, the thing that's, that, that is helpful for me, is that my everyday prayer makes me unstoppable by the enemy. When I've been in the presence of God, I'm unstoppable by the enemy. If there's one thing I can tell you that the devil would love to stop in your life, it's prayer. You can do anything else. But prayer is the one thing he will do anything to destabilize. That's, by the way, that's why, I ta that's why I put my phone on airplane mode when I go to bed. And I don't, ta I don't get it out of there until I'm finished with my quiet time. Because I realize the devil will do anything to destabilize my thinking and my prayer life. If he can throw off your prayer life, he's got you where he wants you. And so I need to understand when I have prayer, I'm unstoppable to the enemy. There's nothing he can do against the prayer of a little child. When we went to Mpiji uh, in, in, in Uganda, uh, and uh, some, we haven't told these stories, but it was such a powerful time. And it was a church, I think some of you remember the story when we talked about our family night, a, ch a church with 15, 16 year olds who are just on fire for Jesus. And one of the stories that really, I mean, they, they do crazy things for God. But one of the things that I, I, I was so excited to hear stories, one little girl, I think she's 16, who was telling us, we're being told by the pastor how she walks into a place where there's a demon-possessed person, and the words coming out of that demon-possessed person's mouth is, my, what was it? Judge. My judge is here. My judge is here. And the guy is panicked. My judge is here. 16-year-old. 16-year-old. She just walks into the room, and the demon that has terrorized everybody is like, my judge is here. Is that demon terrorized by a 16-year-old? Not really. But the Bible says, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Yeah. That little girl is walking around with full assurance of who is in her. The devil has nothing. Lucifer himself cannot touch her because of who is in her. So this is what happens with my prayer. I reconfigure myself. I get to understand who is in me. And when I've spent my time in prayer, I'm unstoppable by the devil. Uh, it's interesting because 2 Corinthians 10, 4 tells us the weapons of our warfare, the weapons that we fight with, they're not carnal weapons. They're not the weapons of this world. They're not the stoppable weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Your prayer can demolish strongholds. Your prayer can demolish the, <laughs> the most devious schemes of hell. There's this song we sing, no power of hell, no scheme of hell. I love those words. Because there's nothing that can stop me when I have God in me. There's nothing. Me and God are a majority. If you read through the scripture, you're going to find people like Daniel, who everybody in government is opposed to you. <laughs> like the whole government, everybody in cabinet has come against you. And it's like, me and God are unstoppable. What are you going to do? Throw me in a, a lion's den. <laughs> it's like, okay, sour. we're going to have fun. We'll just sit. In fact, the lions, I'm sure they were just like, you know, lions, if, you've seen cats and how cats just come. Aah. I bet you that's what happened the whole night. He's like, oh, and he's like, oh, come on, come, let me scratch you. And all the guys are like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm unstoppable. Throw me in the fire. Guess what happens? There's a fourth man with me. Oh, come on. And, and, and this is the person who's unstoppable because they have Jesus. And anyway, the boys even said, even if you kill us. Because <laughs> I know where I'm going. Paul says it is more profitable for me even to go than to remain. I'm unstoppable. Let me tell you guys, when I understood this fact, and it happened to me the day I surrendered my life completely to Jesus, fear left me. Because I'm unstoppable. There's nothing you can do to me. Yeah, whom shall I fear? Psalm 27, 1. So when you understand this, when you spend time in your father's presence, you can't fear your boss. He's only a human being. Lucifer himself is afraid of me. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> You're just a man. I mean, I won't tell him that, by the way. Because that's not a godly thing to say to him. But in my heart of hearts, I'm not afraid of you. And guess what happens when people see you're not afraid? People can tell when someone's afraid. Huh? They can tell this one, I'm not, he's not afraid. He's not moved. He's going to do his work. He's going to be diligent. But he's not afraid. That's what, that was Daniel's story. Daniel, it didn't matter what you did to him. He was just like, okay. And guess what happened? Every time, he got promoted. Every new government would come in. 
And it's like, this guy's not afraid, he got promoted. Because actually, I rea- I've come to realize, people who are in power, they like having somebody around them who is steady and who is not corruptible, who is not afraid. They actually like that. And so Daniel gets promoted from being a, 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 an MP, moves to become a cabinet secretary, moves to become, with every king, he's going up. Like, who, who does that? Usually what kings would do in those days, kill all the people and put their own people. He gets promoted. Eventually, he's like second in command. How is that? It's just he knows who he is. He knows who he is. Uh, So the Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, watch and pray. Watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So when I'm watching and I'm praying, it's that, Lord, when I enter this day, I will not fall into temptation. I will not fall in any way because I know that the flesh itself is weak, but the spirit is willing. And when spirit connects with spirit, something happens. Because that's what happens in prayer. My spirit is connecting with the spirit. Uh, the, the main guard of the enemy is to keep you from praying. And Paul talks about putting on spiritual armor. And he talks about, when he talks about it, at the end he says, you know what? Do all things in prayer. Above all else, do things in prayer. Pray in the spirit in all occasions. This is what Paul says with all kinds, all manners of prayers and requests. This is what Paul is saying to us. That prayer is that significant in your day. When things are spiritually charged, when the Holy Spirit has come into your life, you can discern the things that are going on around you. You can discern the tricks of the enemy. You can discern his traps. And you're able to walk in righteousness. This is what's happening. Paul is walking around in Acts chapter 16. I love that story. And there's a, there's a slave who's walking around, and she's feared by the whole town. Everybody respects her. And she's saying, these are the servants of the, mo- the living God. Servants of the living God. Do you have that verse? Yeah, she followed Paul, the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, somebody without discernment would have been like, yeah, even these ones know. Mm. In fact, let her come on stage and give a testimony. <laughs> Isn't that what you do when you have no discernment? Yeah, you, you have no idea she's a witch doctor. You're asking her to come up onto your church stage and give testimony because she's saying, this is our main pastor. He's a serious guy. But not Paul. He understands. He looks and says, come out of her. Because he understands. He knows the voice of the, of the Lord and that, this is not the voice of the Lord. Let me tell you something. You don't have to study demons. You just have to study God's voice. Yeah. When you understand your father's voice, you will know that is not the father's voice. People will tell you, here's a deal. This must be God's will. It's so good. You'll be like, "Uh uh-uh, that's not my father talking. That's Paul. He knows his father's voice because he spent time with him. How well do you know your father's voice? I really believe this is what God is saying to us guys. This is who we are. We must understand our father's voice. Otherwise, we become those guys who are charlatans. And we're giving people prophecies that that really come out of our longings. Uh, I was watching this video where this pastor from South Africa was confessing. I don't know if any of you saw it on WhatsApp. About the tricks they would do to make people... Uh, some of you saw it, and he was confessing because there are so many tricks they would do to make people, um, like they would hire people in wheelchairs just to build his fame. Those are charlatans. That's not the power we operate with. Uh, <laughs> lest we become the sons of Sceva. Remember those guys? Uh, Acts chapter 19. And uh, I remember hearing um, Apmo uh, talk about that passage, and I really laughed. He said, I want to write a book called Seven Naked Men, How Not to Engage the Devil. How not to try and enter into spiritual war. Seven naked men would be the title. And seven guys, I can see the cover already. <laughs> like these guys are like, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. Get out. The demon tells them, and who are you? <laughs> who are you? Huh? And the one guy beats them and takes all their clothes off. Because they, they have no clue what they're doing. They haven't spent time with the father. Paul, when he says it, it happens. But it's because Paul has authority. Yeah, he spent time investing in that authority. There's a power transfer that is happening uh, when Paul is with God. You know, I, I remember just understanding how prayer is a mighty weapon. I remember somebody who told me that. Prayer is a mighty weapon at the disposal of every man and woman who take time to know God and to love God. In fact, the person said prayer is a guided missile in the hands of every believer. One that can take, I mean, one that is unstoppable by the enemy. And it can take off from any point and land in any point. Imagine God has given you a guided missile. Every day you have it. And many of us are walking around defenseless and weak because we've not understood the power at our disposal. This is what prayer is. My goodness, the devil wants to do everything to keep you from understanding the power you have. He wants to keep you in a spirit of offense. 
He wants to keep you in a spirit of depression and dejection. He wants to keep you feeling this is not working, it's irrelevant. He goes, anything he can do. He wants to give you money. By the way, I think when everything else fails, he starts pampering you with things. Anything he can do to keep you from prayer. Because he understands if this guy knows prayer, my goodness, we are finished. We are finished. Once the church starts praying, the devil is finished. And so let, let me tell you guys, this is so important that you understand why. Let me give you my, my last reason, to be fruitful. My last reason is to be fruitful. <laughs> you know something, uh, Acts 1 8 talks about it, you all know the verse, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. It was a nice Sunday school song we used to teach them. We used to sing with my kids that helped me memorize that verse. Such a powerful You know, God created us to be fruitful and to multiply. That was our, our, his intention. Every one of us is meant to be fruitful and multiply. If you're a son of God, you're supposed to have fruitfulness and multiplication as part of your DNA. If you start a business, that business will be fruitful and multiply and impact people. That's what you are. Otherwise, it's not, it's not being run according to God's principles. If you are running, whatever you are, whatever God blesses you with is to help you be fruitful and increase and multiply and impact. We're going to be talking about fruitfulness uh, uh, today. But every one of us was created to be fruitful. None of you was created to just go to the grave alone, to go into heaven alone. Every one of us was created to have an impact on countless people. That's how God created us. That's your DNA. That's your makeup. That's the family you come from. You're an influencer. That's why at Mavuno we say we're a fearless influencer. It's not an unspiritual word. It's because we understand that we were created to multiply. We're created to influence and to impact. And you know the way to do it, John chapter 15, Jesus tells his disciples, he tells them that the way to do it is to abide. Yeah, if you want to be fruitful, abide. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. There's an abiding that he wants us to do. In fact, he then says, just do the next verse. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. God, God is glorified when I bear fruit. God is glorified when the thing I'm doing impacts many. He wants it to, mu to multiply. He wants it to fill the earth. He wants his glory to fill the earth through me. That's what I was created for. But the prerequisite for bearing fruit is spending time in his presence. Many times people think this business will bear fruit if I spend time in the business. But actually God's prerequisite is spend time with me. I will give you divine ideas. I once came to understand in my life that a divine idea is much more important than all the money in the world. One divine idea can change your business permanently. Your life can be changed permanently by one divine idea. I've, my wife and I have come to discover this. You know, sometimes people are asked to give fast fruits. And they're like, you're already asking me to give 10% and then 90%? What will I live from? Have you ever, have you ever had a thought like, like, what am I supposed to live on? But you know what God wants us to understand? My economy is not your economy. One divine idea can give you 50 times what you earn. That's how God operates. God is a God of fruitfulness. And he's saying, test me. Test me. So, so, so let me leave some concluding thoughts. I'm hoping that somebody in the house now, if ever you ever have that thought of, why am I praying and God already knows, that this has co completely changed your perspective on why you wake up at 4.30. This, is, this has changed you. Well, yesterday when I was talking to my pastors, I say to them, and now you're all my pastors, by the way, so I can say the same thing I say to them. I say, when the, when the church shows up at 4.30 to pray, me, I woke up at 3. I was, at, I was praying from 3 o'clock. I was praying about my stuff because I also have somebody who has to cover me. So I pray for myself. So that when I show up at 4.30, whenever you see me at 4.30 in one of your Zoom calls, I'm not there to pray for myself. My, prayer, my, sort, my issues are sorted. Me, I come to pray for you. So when Pastor Angie says, uh, pray for needs for people, um, pray for your needs, me, I'm like, Lord, I see this person on the call, bless them. Let their office open up. I'm praying for my church. Why? Because I'm doing my priestly role at that point. Yeah. Because my, sort, my issues were sorted out a long time ago. You never wake up at the same time as your children. Discipleship group leaders in the house. How do you show up with the people you're praying for? Who will pray for yourself if you're there with them? Who will pray for them if you're so busy praying for yourself? You must make time to be able to pray for yourself. So you have time to pray for your disciples. So, so I'm going to challenge you. I mean, prayer, one hour prayer is fantastic, and I'm glad we're doing it. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad that some of us thought 4.30 to 5.30 was an ungodly hour, and now we no longer think so. 
we've realized that God is in charge even at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> Amen. But now I want to challenge you. It's time for you, if you're leading a discipleship group, to figure out when do I pray for myself? Because at that time, I can't be praying. I'm so busy uh, looking for prayer requests for my discipleship group on the chat, uh, making sure that guys are awake, they're there. So I'm always aware of what's happening for others. I, I'm a leader. Uh, when I show up at 4.30 prayer, I need to be showing up ready to model. So have you noticed, for those of you who come for 4.30 prayers, because I've come to all your groups, have you noticed I always come on and I turn on my video? Even if nobody in your group has turned on. Why do I do that? Because I'm here to model. I'm here to teach my children how to pray. I want to model to my disciples that when I pray, this is how I pray. And so I don't even move away from the screen. I stay there because I want you to see how to pray. Because some people have never prayed for now. I want to and then I turn, off my, I turn on my mic. Why? Because I want you to hear my voice. Even if you're not hearing the words, you're hearing my voice. And it's possible. you're saying it's possible to actually pray for an hour. And so as a discipleship group leader, why are you turning off your video? Who's going to, who are your people going to model? You want them to model Pastor M. They're not following Pastor M. They're following you. So you don't show up and, and, for, and for real, it means that by the time you're showing up at 4.30, you should have already put on your makeup. Because huh? <laughs> I know the reason your video is off. It's because you're not looking presentable. But that's because you just rolled out of bed and into the video. <laughs> Wash your face and be there ready. Yeah. You're modeling for your people. So, so I'm, I'm not, I'm, I can't be doing the same thing my children are doing because then who's going to teach them? Imagine if everyone in the house was just going, ga, 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 you know. It's like, how will they learn to talk? Because that, literally that's what's happening in prayer. Some guys are like this. Uh, uh, uh. So you talk to them, hi, baby. How are you? Then they start saying, papa, papa. You know, it's like you're, someone has to teach. Discipleship group leader, that's your job. Your disciples are looking and they're saying, oh, Sumit's video is on. Okay, this is how Sumit prays. Oh, wow, it's doable. Yeah, yeah that's the way it's done. So, so don't, don't let your pastor beg you, put on your video. No, 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 no. You know why you're doing it. You're a leader. By the time the church is growing, by the way, those prayer meetings are going to grow. Huh? Amen. Yeah, you're going to have to pay for extra bandwidth on Zoom and you'll have 500 people in your prayer meetings and 1,000. They'll be there. But let them come and not find that everybody is a child. Let them come and find that there are people here to teach us. Yeah. And that's you. That's why God has placed you in that place. So a quick, let me just make some quick rem concluding remarks, and then I can end this talk. So number one, uh, number one uh, concluding remark is, please pray for at least one hour a day. As, 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 as a servant of God, as a son of this house, pray for at least an hour a day. Make that your ambition. Uh, just spend time with God. Now you know why. Whenever you forget, go back to the notes from this message and pray at least an hour a day. Uh, Jesus found his disciples sleeping. Um, and he said something very interesting. He said he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? I wonder if Jesus says that sometimes. Seriously? One hour? Like, like honestly. Hype says, one hour. You couldn't, you couldn't watch with me for one hour. It's like Jesus is like, please. Okay, I know Hype says is always there. But I'm just using that as an example. It's like one hour. So make it at least an hour. I mean, how many times does Jesus find you in bed and saying, seriously? After all the blessings I gave you yesterday. <laughs> I mean, I provided for you communion. That's what he's telling his disciples, eh? Like he fed them. In fact, I suspect they were asleep because they ate too much at the last supper. <laughs> it's like, I overblessed you. Seriously, in my worst moment, you can't even be with me for one hour. And it's like, please, don't ever miss that prayer. Make it your ambition. By the way, my ambition this year is I'm not missing any of those prayers. I know sometimes I hear somebody say, oh, I was tired, we got home late. Figure it out, guys. Figure it out. The devil is not taking a break. So you can't take a break that day. Get into prayer. Better even go back to sleep after that. But just, yeah, take a power nap over lunch. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> just make it your ambition from today. I will not miss prayer this year. This year I'm praying every day, at least for an hour. Number two, pray with one accord. Pray with others in one accord. We see this in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 2 says, when, when, the, when, the, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. There's a power. There's a power of agreement. Let me tell you guys, when we started praying at 4.30, I started to see answers to prayer in my own life that I, I had not imagined. Like things I'd prayed for for long, all of a sudden I just started seeing divine acceleration. And it wasn't because I was praying more focused prayers than I'd prayed before. But I believe it's because people were agreeing in prayer. 
There's something that happens when I say and Trevor says amen. So be it. That's what happens. When we are saying amen to each other's prayers, when I'm putting a prayer request and people are saying amen, Pastor M, it's happened. Guess what? Like the family praying is much more powerful than the pastor praying. Much more powerful. And so when we start to pray in one accord, expect miracles. So, so get into the business of praying with one accord. Uh, if, so for those of you who are so used, you love having your own time with the Lord, do what I do. Move that time outside the 4.30 time. But come into that time so that you can pray with one accord. Let's pray in agreement with one another. Number three, learn to pray with passion. Pray with passion. I mean, I love the, you know the word in Hebrew chapter 5. It talks about Jesus, uh, 5.7. Five, it says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. It's interesting that reverent submission was not shown by being humble and meek. It was shown by fervent cries. Oh my gosh. It's like, guys, God wants us to be passionate in our prayer. He wants us to, to, to express ourselves in prayer. That's something many of us were not taught when you're a younger Christian. And maybe you're struggling to be fervent in your prayer. You, don't even, you even struggle praying out aloud. But let me tell you, it's just because you haven't met a demon big enough. There are some demons you'll come across and you, oh, Lord. <laughs> Learn to be passionate in your prayers. God, God, I mean, when you believe that he's there, he's in your presence. Just learn to express yourself to him. I mean, by the way, it's interesting because, again, I, I really think Pastor S taught us this. Because huh? we grew up, when you were part of Nairobi Chapel, it was, prayer was dignified. Prayer was nice. It's like you compose yourself. It's like you do it privately inside your heart. <laughs> Pastor S is the one who taught us how to pray fervent prayers. And to pray loud prayers. And to pray prayers that, it's like, for me, I'm like, I want the demon to hear what I'm praying. Because I want him to understand how powerless he is. I want him to take a report and say, that one, let's not touch him today. He's armed. <laughs> you know? So pray fervent prayers. Pray fervent prayers. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. For me, I've just learned not to be a diva in prayer. I, I don't want to be a diva in prayer. Guys, anything else I can be a diva, but not in my prayers. Yeah. I, I remember one time, uh, Bishop Adeboye, uh, RCCG, largest church in the world, 40,000 congregations. Uh, all, almost every country in the world. And one day he was coming to Nairobi. So I wasn't able to go, but my friend was there. And he took a video and sent it. And I remember the delegation was coming into church. So it's like the bishop is here. So they, they stopped the cars at the gate. So imagine Hill City. They stopped the, the, the cars at the gate and they come up the whole way from the driveway all the way in a procession, dancing, worship team, Everybody dancing. Guys in serious suits. You know Nigerians, they don't mess with this stuff. I mean, like, everybody's got their bling. They're looking awesome. And then I'm like, so the guys told me, guess which one the bishop is. So I'm like, it must be this one. Hey, but look at that guy's suit. I think it's this guy. Man, this guy looks like he has authority. I couldn't guess. And you know why? Because the bishop was the guy who was, had a tambourine and was just jumping up and down with the singers. And he wasn't even with the guys with the suit. He was up in front with the singers, with a tambourine. Humble. Like I looked at the guy, he looked like a gate man. He didn't even look like he was in the worship team because even the worship team was quite styled up. Eh? And I'm like, this is a bishop of one of the largest churches. Now. Like he was like David. In fact, that day I understood why Michelle was offended. I was like, seriously, you're, rep you're representing RCCG guy. I'm sure there are guys who tell him, like, seriously, you're representing the biggest church in the world? It's time for you to have a little, uh-uh. Before his father, he's a child. And he always goes to church with a tambourine because that's him. I'm like, no wonder God has blessed him. Yeah, no wonder God blesses him. Guys, passion. Passion for God. Never get so important that you come late for worship. Let, let, <laughs> let, let the non-believers come late for worship. Let the newcomers of your church come late for worship. You know how church starts filling up at 10.30? It's like you start thinking, does Mabuno have a 10.30 service? I thought it was 10. Because it's like the worship team is just practice and warm up. Then people come to hear the sermon. Those are people who don't understand who the true star of the show is. The true star is not the pastor. The true pa star is Jesus. And Jesus is in the house when we are worshiping him. So be early for worship. Teach your children to be early. Don't train your children to come late for worship. If they see you doing that, they'll grow up not understanding who we are coming to worship. They think we're coming to worship the pastor. So, so be that guy who's like, man, I need, guys, we're late. I need to be there for worship. I need to sit in the front so I can jump up and down and thank my God. 
That's the people who understand. So be fervent. Be passionate about prayer. Number, the last one, form a prayer habit. Form a prayer habit. Uh, Acts chapter 3 verse 1. It talks about the fact, I love this. It says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. The ninth hour. I love that. What would they say for you? What is your hour of prayer? Is it known? I mean, it's like it's the hour of prayer. Like they had a habit and they formed a habit. You know something? Habit is stronger than desire. You, you can have so much passion and desire to pray, but habit is what will make you actually pray. So form that prayer habit. If you're, if you're going to be, one of the things I challenge you is fast. I know we did the 21-day fast. By the way, you guys are looking awesome. <laughs> you're all looking really cool. I mean, it's so nice. I'm looking, I'm like, man, you look 20 years younger. What happened? <laughs> I fasted. <laughs> Things of God are interesting, isn't it? They're counterintuitive. Many of you thought, if I fast a liquid fast for 21 days, I'll die. Actually, you didn't die. You looked better. When I went for my, my checkup, I went after that. And the, actually, I was in hospital. And I was telling Carol, the nurse uh, had my prescription. And she looked and she looked at me. She said, Moredi Wanjao? And I said, it's me. So she said, huh? And she says, you're picking this for somebody? I said, no, it's mine. <laughs> She said, but the guy here, it says 52 years old. I was like, yeah, I'm 52. By the way, she started laughing. I was like, you don't look 52. I told her, how, how old do I look? Okay, I, I won't tell you what she said, because you know, I thought maybe she was flattering me. She, okay, she said, she said, you look 40. I was like, well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's how we roll. That's Mungu too. <laughs> But that's the beauty of following you, you, the habits. They shape you. So fast. I, I, one of the habits my wife and I have, we fast once a week, every Thursday. We don't wait for the next long fast in, in May or in September. We, we fast as a, as a lifestyle. So do it. Uh, th those are the habits you're forming that shape you. Do a, do a prayer retreat this week. I mean, sorry, this, this year. Do at least two prayer retreats. I, I challenge people to do at least two a year. I do three. Just go away for two nights without your spouse, without your children, and just be in a, go to a retreat center somewhere and just spend time praying for your business. Who else will do it? You're the leader of the business. You expect your employees to be praying for that business. How? They're not interested as you are. So, so spend some time. Make sure you invest in those habits. I remember one great story I had from Pastor Godwin. I don't know if the person is here, but he was telling me about someone in his church who was wrongly imprisoned at Langata Women's Prison. And I remember hearing the story when I came to your prayer meeting. And this lady, she says, when she was in prison at 4.30, every morning at Langata Women's Prison, she and the prisoners were praying. Come on. Fearless influence. Fearless influence. Like 4.30, you, like you've woken up, guys. It's prayer time. It's the hour of prayer. It's like the habit is so in her. Like people are just, like we pray at 4.30. Whether I'm in prison, you know, some of you be like, how can God, what was he thinking? He's like, I've been forgotten. She's like, I'm in here. Like Paul and Silas, guess what happened? The next day, by the way, they were released. They were released in an impossible situation. She didn't expect it. By the way, I'm hearing such powerful testimonies in this prayer time. Huh? It's so shocking, some of the testimonies I'm hearing in your prayer times. She was released. Form the habits that will help you. Don't, those of you who are struggling to wake up, part of the reason is because of how late you're watching TV. TV is not your portion in Jesus' name. What are they giving you that you will need in eternity? Seriously. What are they giving you? There's nothing. Go to bed early so you can wake up early. These are the habits of success. Early to bed, early to rise. They used to say that when we were younger. Yeah. Remember that you're in training, guys. This 4.30 to 5.30, it's just training. It's not, it's not it. This is like practice camp before the game. So, so we're in training right now because God is going to take you from level to level in the kingdom. Some of you right now, you're leading a discipleship group. Praise God for you. But you know what? Your aspiration should be to lead a, a mission or community of multiple discipleship groups. That's what you should, be try, you should be trusting God for because your spiritual authority will only increase. You're not created to be, to be stagnant. You're created to multiply and to influence more people. And if you're leading a discipleship, a mission or community, you should be praying to become a zonal pastor. That's what you're going to, and we're going to be talking about this as we go along, the, the different uh, spaces. And every one of you should be praying to impact nations. Because God has told, he's told you, isn't it? It's, ask me. Does God tell you many things to ask him? 
It's like, I know the things you want, but here's one I can tell you, ask me this one. Like I've planned it for you, so ask me. By the time you're telling your child, ask me, it's because you already have it. <laughs> so it's like, I, I got one, for you. ask me, and I'll give you nations. So guess what? This prayer right now for one hour is just preparing you to lead nations. When you're leading nations, you'll be like Daniel, you pray seven times a day. But for now, at least pray once. <laughs> you know, pray once. So let's make this a habit. Prayer is the steering wheel. It's not, it is not the spare wheel. It is not the spare wheel. So I want to, I want to just, uh, maybe as I conclude, just a couple of stories. Winner's Chapel. How many know Winner's Chapel? I had the privilege of visiting Winner's Chapel in Nigeria. I mean, these guys have 10,000 churches. Uh, it's a movement with 10,000 churches. But that was 2020. I don't know how many there are now. I mean, they're, they're growing the blazers. Um, they have, like, buildings upon buildings. Uh, five, their headquarters is 5,000 acres. When guys were saying, somebody asked in one of the questions, why should we be having 20 acres? Can we sell, like, five and pay? I was like, you've lacked spiritual imagination. <laughs> like, these guys have a 5,000 acre headquarters. And I went there, and you could see why they needed it. I mean, they have estates, they have schools, they have universities, they have fueling stations. I mean, it's a crazy thing. The church just impacting. Uh, largest, largest building in the world, church building in the world. Uh, this thing sits 50,000 people. It's larger than anything in the States. <laughs> but every day, 6 a.m., Winners Chapel across the world, they wake up to pray for an hour. Every day. No wonder God has blessed their church. Have you wondered why they are blessed? It's because they pray. I mean, we're there and our eyes were boggled. By the way, all we could say is, wow. Wow. Like, by the way, that word just kept coming out of our, wow. Those who are there, some of you are there. Like, wow. Like, you run out of space. They have 50,000 sitter, and then that's not counting the overflow. And the overflow is bigger than the 50,000. It's 40,000. So it's like 90,000 people every Sunday worshiping. And that's just one of their 10,000 churches. I mean, you're like, wow. But they pray. Yoido Gospel Church, this one, a full gospel church, Yongi Cho, Reverend Yongi Cho, passed on a little while back. Largest congregation in the world, like single congregation, 800,000 members, almost a million members. Uh, one congregation. Uh, but you know what? <laughs> For the last two decades, I think it's two decades, they've had a daily prayer meeting at 6 a.m. Like, for an hour like week like they do it every day <laughs> every week for the last 20 years like i used to be in, in in seminary with members of their church in the states and you'd always hear the dog creaking and they don't pray in their houses at your zoom they go to the church and they'd be going downtown to the court to their i mean they'd be going down to the branch with their kids and they'd pray then come back and take their kids to school i remember thinking these guys are crazy they're, fa they're fanatics I didn't know the secret. No wonder they've grown. RCCG. Now that one was not wow. We went to see the redemption camp. There's nothing that you will ever see that will prepare you for that place. There's nothing I can tell you that will prepare you. Even if I talk for an hour, you'll go there and you'll still be in shock. I mean, that place, we didn't say wow. We laughed. You know, you see something, you just start laughing. Like, there's no wow. It's like... <laughs> Like, no. Ah, like, we laughed. Every time they told us something, we laughed. Like, their, their sanctuary is three kilometers by three kilometers. So three kilometers, right now, from here to the main road is one kilometer. Three kilometers by three kilometers. They take offering with golf carts. There's no way. You laugh. Like, like, honestly, everything about them is Ridiculous. Ridiculous. But you know, here's the interesting thing we discovered. Reverend Adeboye, every day, and it's a fact, he walks around in the city. Like I told, first of all, their city is not 5,000 acres. Nobody knows how big it is. Like they keep telling you every year it expands. Like it's huge. So, okay, fun, here's a fun, a fun fact. Three kilometers by three kilometers, they know they'll, they'll never be smaller than this. Because their plan is to, the, the bishop's dream is to have a church sanctuary the size of Ibadan. Ibadan is the second largest city in Africa by land surface. So can you imagine a church bigger than Nairobi City? Sanctuary, not, not the land. I know, it's just... 
leave golf carts. You need drones for collecting offering now at that point. Yeah, we just laughed. Here's the thing about that guy. 11 a.m. to 4, 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. every day. How many hours are those? It's like five hours. He's on the streets of that city praying. Every day of the week. Like when they have their fearless summit, their equivalent, they have usually about, uh, I think about a million people showing up. All in the same place. Um, he, he has an apartment behind the church. And he fasts from day one until the end. In fact, usually they find him in the middle of his, 20, like a long fast. And he preaches fasting. He, he just lives behind the tent and just fasts. You know what I say? No wonder. No wonder. You want to see miracles in your life? That's what prayer does. That's what prayer does. Guys, I want to conclude for us right now. And my prayer is that you're convicted in your heart. That prayer is not going to be a spare wheel in your life. That this year, prayer is going to be the first thing in your life. You'll be a prayer warrior. That listen, it doesn't matter. It's not about knowing the words to pray. It's loving your God. When somebody asks you about, about why you pray, you know, tell them, it's, it's because I understand I'm connecting with HQ. I'm, I'm building a love relationship with my father. I'm commanding my day. I'm, I'm, I'm taking over. This is what I'm doing. I'm being fruitful. I'm preparing myself to be fruitful. My goodness, when you have a church with 40,000 congregations in the world, you praying five hours a day is the least thing you can do. You can't manage them. There's no church system that has ever been built to manage 40,000 churches. Now, some of you are struggling with your discipleship group with five couples or five people, and half of them don't show up. When you have discipleship group, those are your problems. This guy has 40,000 churches. Am I speaking to somebody in the house? This is how I'm training myself to get ready for the big things God wants to bring into my life. So I want us to just stand up for a minute and right now we respond to God in prayer. If you're watching, I want you to just stand up as well wherever you are. Remember, we pray fervently, we pray with passion, we pray before our God. Just speak to your God right now. And you're saying, Father, I want to know you. I want to be passionate about you. I want to learn how to pray. Jesus, teach me how to pray like you taught your disciples. Lord, this year I want to be a prayer warrior. I want to understand myself in you. I want to know my role in your kingdom. Lord, I want to tap into headquarters. I want to hear broadcast for me every day. I want to be able to not walk into a situation not knowing what God wants for that situation. I want to be prepared for everything that comes forward in my day. Lord, I want to commit myself that I'm going to pray this year. Prayer is not going to be a spare will. It's going to be a steering will. It's going to be the thing that guides me in every space, Lord. I know who I am. I know whose I am. Lord, teach me to pray. Make me passionate about prayer. No more excuses, Lord. No more walking around like somebody who doesn't know why they're here. Lord Jesus, I want to grow in my authority. I want to grow in ability. That Lord, when I walk into a room, the demons will flee. I want them to be able to say, Paul we know, Rocky we know, Moravi we know, Trevor we know. I want them to be able to know my name this year, Lord, because I spent time with my Father. Lord, I want to spend so much time with you that I'll be prepared for anything that comes my way, Lord. Lord, this is me. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. I want to love you, Lord. I I want to grow in love with you, Lord. I want to be passionate about, I want my children to see something different about me. I want them to know that, Lord, I'm not in this thing for religion. I'm here because I love you. I want my love for you to transmit to my children, Lord. I want them to love you just as much as me. I want my discipleship group to love you the way I love you, Lord, because they can see me passionate for you. They can see me loving you. They can see me holding on to you until you bless me, Lord. Lord, I want to be your son, your servant. I want to be with you every place where you are. Lord, I want to do only what I see my Father doing. This is my prayer, Lord. This is my prayer. Father God, I invite you to come inhabit the praises of your people. Come into our prayers right now. Lord, we know you've said that, Father God, you're the kind of Father who gives good things to his children. And Lord, I pray that you give us the gift of your presence. Give us the gift of intercession. I call upon you to release the gift of intercession in this house. Oh God, release the spirit of intercession in this house, that your house will be known as a house of prayer. Lord, this is what we long for. We want to be a generation that prays. We want to walk in your presence. Lord, we want to, to, to live heaven on earth because we are in touch with you, Lord. We want your presence to be everything to us, Lord. We want to desire you more than anything, Lord. This is what we want, Lord. And so we invite you, Jesus. We invite you to come. We invite you to come.
And so, Father, I just speak over your people right now. Thank you because you're releasing your gifts. Thank you because you're going to wake us up to pray at, at, at times we're not used to waking up. And Lord, I thank you because you're going to give us a hunger to seek you. I speak over you, God's people, a hunger for God. <laughs> I speak that the Lord will wake you up in the middle of the night to pray. I speak that you will desire God more than anything, more than food, more than money, more than relation, more than anything else. This is your portion in Christ Jesus. This is the year the Lord has even prophesied it himself over you. I declare over you that you'll be a lover of God. You'll be a God chaser. This is your destiny this year. And so, Father, I bless your people now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and God's people say it together. Amen. Come on, let's give glory to God. Bless the Lord. Come on, can we celebrate Pastor M one more time for that amazing word on prayer? I think we'll, our prayer is not to just to be hearers, but to be doers. And this is one of them that you can activate. And so what I want to challenge you between, between today and end of day, desire to look for someone and just say, how can I pray for you? Uh, desire to connect with someone specifically not from your campus. And just say, hey, I've, you know, I've never met you. I've, this is my first time meeting you. How are you doing? Uh, of course, they'll start anticipating that you'll tell them how they can pray. And so prepare your prayer items. So, so you're not guessing. Prepare your prayer item and say, this is what I've been desiring someone to pray over this for me. And let's, let's desire to be able to not just pray for people, but to receive our prayer uh, as well. Ideally, it's time for, uh, we need to be doing uh, discussion groups. Uh, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to allow us to take an early break. But when you sit in the tables uh, over the break, one of you will, find divine, will feel divinely enabled to ask guys, what did you learn? So if it's you who feels that, just say, hey guys, my name is so-and-so. What did you hear God tell you today? What phrase stood out for you? What one thing do you feel you're going to do? So those will be the conversations around our tables. That's okay, Pastor Godwin. All right, so that then, because if, if we do our groups and then go, we'll be late. But you can do that on your tables. We're going to take a slightly longer break, just about 30 minutes. But it's to allow you to have those conversations uh, in your table. And so in 30 minutes, it will be exactly, it will be like that 11. So at 11, we should be here. At 11, we should be here ready for the next uh, session. So two things. Number one, look for someone to pray. Prepare your prayer item when someone asks you that so that you can be able to pray together. But number two, in your tables, one of you just lead the conversation and say, what is God saying to you? What are you going to do about it? Thank guys. Those who are on Zoom, uh, those who are on YouTube, I can they take a break, refresh uh, and all that. Let's meet back at 11. Take a break, guys. See you at 11. <laughs>